Anthony Kinslow II, PhD, is the founder and CEO of Gemini Energy Solutions. Gemini democratizes the small commercial energy audit sector, creating affordable investment grade energy audits and supporting efforts to drastically increase workforce diversity in the energy efficiency sector. Dr. Kinslow II is also a consultant for Clean Energy Works. This nonprofit organization seeks to accelerate private capital utility investments in inclusive clean energy solutions at the grid edge. He also lectures at Stanford University, where he co-teaches two courses, Racial Equity in Energy and Quest for an Inclusive Clean Energy Economy. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Anthony Kinslow. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, apologies. I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you can pin it, that'd be great. And I think we can get this working. We're seeing it perfect. It's ready, good to go. Great. Okay, let me, um, there. So, as uh, I always struggle with your name, Alohani. Am I getting it right this time? Aloha Lani. Uh, I apologize. I apologize. No, you're fine. I'm out of practice. I, I, I went several weeks practicing and then I stopped. So, <laughs> But thank you, everybody, for um, being here and attending. Uh, once again, my name is Anthony. I start. I, I think I should start off by explaining. I started Gemini Energy Solutions to address the uh, fundamental diversity issues within the clean energy space and also address this gap in addressing commercial buildings, in particular, small commercial buildings. And when you think of small commercial buildings, you know, you can think of churches, you can think of community centers, uh, restaurants, all these places that house our, uh, our community, our, our places of community, our places that we engage and in, in enjoy our times in. And I recognized during my time at Stanford that all the companies that were starting up, all these startups were focusing on large commercial, 50,000 square feet plus, yet 90% of the commercial building stock was under 25,000 square feet. So that's a little bit of a context to uh, Gemini Energy Solutions. And today though, uh, sorry, today I wanna to talk about clean energy hubs and this new concept of a revenue generating microgrid that we're starting at Gemini. And uh, give you a, a specific case study that is happening in South Hayward, California. Before going any further, I do want to thank our partners for realizing the clean energy hubs that we are working on. Clean Energy Group provides financing for that. OpConnect, the electric vehicle charging stations. Green the Church is our community partner, network partner. Alphamo Tech provides the uh, solar. And Nest provides the capital stack that I'll show you in shortly. So Glad Tidings is a prominent black church in South Hayward, black led church rather. It's a very diverse church, but it's black led. And they approached us about providing a clean, smart and resilient campus, really from the standpoint of how do they take their community to the next level with clean energy. Now, South Hayward is, since this is a California group mostly, I'm uh, are familiar with South Hayward, it is a justice allocated as a justice 40 community, which means that it has been historically uh, burdened, overburdened with pollution and economically disadvantaged. And it is also the home of Glad Tidings. And what does that, some of the disproportionate burdens look like? Well, first off, you have to think about it from a standpoint of access and adoption. And in rooftop solar, you can see a clear discrepancy in black rooftop solar in majority black neighborhoods as opposed to um, any other racial ma um, majority neighborhood, right? And this discrepancy extends not just across solar, but really access to all clean technology. And so one of the main goals of the Clean Energy Hub is to address this discrepancy by making, creating a hub in areas that historically have not been allowed or been actively ex um, excluded from the clean energy transition. And, and giving them a space that allows for increased familiarity with this clean technology and, and um, also some more resiliency, right? These communities, we look at what's happening in Florida right now, it's gonna hit also Georgia with this hurricane. And we know that at the end of the day, 
which communities are going to be disproportionately impacted in terms of power outage and how long they have power out, how long it takes for help to get there. And so one of these clean energy hubs are trying to address is provide the foundation, the initial step to addressing uh, these challenges. So as a project overview, this um, Glad Tidings, our clean energy hub, which as I mentioned, a revenue generating microgrid, and I'll get to the revenue generating part, is expected to have 668 kilowatts uh, of generation across the entire campus. This is solar and um, uh, carport uh, solar, excuse me, rooftop and carport solar. One thing that's unique about our clean energy hubs is we're using bi-directional EV charging stations. And for those who aren't familiar, bi-directional is essentially this idea that when you plug your car into a building, that you can charge it or you can use the energy that's already in the battery to charge the building. So it goes both ways. And this is technology that is relatively new compared, compared to solar uh, and, and other clean technologies, but it's something that hasn't been adopted widely yet. And in fact, my knowledge, we're one of the first people that, who are trying to do this um, on the scale of a microgrid and use these as microgrids. And the revenue generating aspect of this comes into play with the fact that you have now charging stations that can that can charge cars, not just in the community, but those passing by. And it hits on two general, um, excuse me, it hits on two general benefits. The first is, the first is that we are doing, the first is that they can actually generate revenue from the charging station. And the second is that you're addressing a, a sorry, um, uh, you are addressing a fundamental barrier in these communities, and that is energy charging deserts with these clean energy hubs. In South Hayward, for instance, when these five directional charging stations go up, they'll be the only charging stations in multiple miles around. So all the households and the multifamily buildings that are in the, that area will ha finally have charging stations and now can actually procure electric vehicles because now there's a re place to charge them. Of course, with our micro, or with our clean energy hubs, we focus on efficiency and electrification as well. And as you can see, the revenue, um, the revenue generation is really what drives this. $400,000 to a million in revenue annually is what we estimate, as opposed to only $30,000 in annual bill savings. So what does this look like? The South um, Glad Tidings campus is quite large. And it's unique in that way in terms of churches. Most churches aren't this big, so most places won't receive that level of revenue generation. But in this case, you have the South Campus, which is right along a major street and a few miles off the highway. And, and then you have the North Campus, which is right in the midst of uh, a large community. And you can see how where the solar will be throughout the spaces. As I mentioned, um, Glad Tidings is looking for to take their community to the next level through clean energy. And Bishop Macklin wrote a book of the canvas of tomorrow, which really highlights his work, um, which really highlights his work up until now in the last 20, 30 years in that community. And he realizes that they've hit kind of a standing point that they have done what they can do with the resources they have, and they need a new way forward. And so with clean energy hubs, there are, four main aspects of this, integrating clean energy technology, removing and reducing barriers that inhibit local citizens, strengthen existing efforts to improve the health and wealth and security of communities, and promote decarbonization, sustainability, and economic development. We use, now, Glad Tidings is a church, but we don't only work with churches. We, but we identify it as community anchors is who we partner with. And those are trusted organizations institutions that are regularly communicating, <coughs> excuse me, um, regular, um, regularly communicating with the um, community. The reason for this is that, sorry, a um, little bit of a cold from my child, so sorry. <coughs> uh, excuse me. The reason for these community anchors, is that, that we work with community anchors, is that we want places that the community already feel comfortable going to. As one person said, 
we're only going to move at the speed of trust. And if we're trying to work with places that are, are not trusted by the community, then our goals of increasing familiarity, increasing access, and really changing that community um, from inside, it, it will stall at this start. So what are the, so the feasibility study that we provide, and we do this for every organization, is give them options. And from those options, we interview the, and the, the leadership and find out, hey, what makes most sense for you? And in this case, of course, all electric equipment, uh, the ownership model, which is really key, I think critical and overlooked often is the discrepancy in ownership of solar amongst um, majority black communities compared to other uh, communities. They are also heavily lagging behind in that way. And so we, we focus on making sure that they own both the solar and the EV charging stations to maximize the revenue. Uh, Plug-in electric vehicles, they actually will be purchasing plug-in electric vehicles to use for transporting um, their, the, uh, transporting uh, food and other services to their community and, then, and using and charging at their own charging stations. For efficiency and electrification, uh, there's replacement of over 500 bulbs to LEDs. A lot of people talk about LEDs being ubiquitous. That is not the case in black communities. They are still something of a novelty often. And so over 500 of the bulbs across the campus will be replaced, replacing 12 package units of gas furnaces, uh, water heating, gas water heaters, and also something um, often overlooked, which is kitchen equipment. Um, we are installing induction stoves throughout. And one of the things that's exciting is that if for some of these folks visiting the church, it'll be the first time seeing an induction stove in person, often the first time actually hearing it, what an induction stove is. <laughs> and you can quickly see the difference that replacing the, um, the, the increase in um, efficient electrification has on the energy usage um, kilowatt hours per day. Uh, over the orange in the um, slide on the left, the orange is pre-upgrade and the right is post-upgrade. And another, for cooling, it's, it's as dramatic, where you can see that there's dramatic, expected dramatic reduction in cooling energy usage. For the sake of time, I'm gonna jump a few slides as well. As I mentioned, 668 kilowatt hours, uh, examples of benefits for this, um, shading from the rain, space for electric vehicles, and, and being able to charge electric vehicles directly from the solar. Now, the, the, we, we are actually establishing two separate microgrids on the campus, one on the north campus and one on the south campus. And in, from interviewing the leadership, they identified these critical loads that needed to be ran uh, when power went out. And what's key, critical, what's important about this is they want to be able to provide services to their community even when the grid is out. I mentioned that they're actually purchasing electric vehicles. They're looking at two Nissan Leafs and one Kia EV6. We are also are gonna install Tesla Powerwalls because this is the first time doing, um, doing this type of work. We wanna make sure that they have resiliency and there's no um, issues, that there's no breaks in that. But our, our analysis does show that just using the electric vehicles, they could be completely off grid 99% of the time, 99% of the year. So that means charging their cars during the day and using them as energy or at night um, instead of using the grid. So th there's, of course, energy savings from that standpoint as well, not just from uh, using during uh, extreme weather events. This is a quick graph of where the charging stations would be. Um, you can see right out across the campus in the south campus as well as in the north. Um, on the, the smaller image that is the South Campus, and that's where the DC charging stations will be, as that's more close to the access accessible from the main road, and that's going to be major, the major driver of the revenue generation. One of the great things about these charging stations, by the way, is that uh, our partner OpConnect actually allows for the church to decide how much they're charging, right? It's not a set price, and so um, their church members, for instance, could get a, a discounted um, price to their 
uh, charging uh, at, or just the community members in general could get a discounted price to the charging while people passing by could would, could have to pay the standard price or even a premium. California is a unique place in that there's a lot of programs and incentives that we can utilize. Uh, but what we think, the reason we think clean energy helps to work outside of just California is that is that the revenue generation is not is not driven by solar, and so all the issues with solar interconnection, uh, permitting, and, and the general uh, animosity towards solar in certain states, uh, we can avoid by essentially saying, okay, we won't wait for interconnection. We will just <coughs> excuse me. We will just plug in, uh, use our solar just for the rev uh, just for the charging stations. And, and make our revenue that way. And that often will be enough to pay, pay off uh, the clean energy hubs. Sorry, um, were you not able to see my screen before? I got to notice that you can see my screen now. We, we can always see your screen. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, a few minutes left. Um, just a quick financials. The cost we're estimating $3.5 million with the annual savings revenue of 875000 That's on average over 12 years. We expect that to um, go start lower, maybe 400000 and work its way up, uh, in part because of the lack of existing electric vehicles in that community. But we all know with California, that is going to change and change drastically, especially when there's charging in that community for them to um, so that the, the often used excuse of, uh, well, where am I going to charge, um, goes away. And I want to leave with this. Uh, if we install a, a clean energy hub in all Justice 40 communities, that is around 13,581 uh, communities across this country, we could see $4 billion of annual revenue generation each year in those communities. That money that stays in those communities, money that is used directly to improve those communities' resiliency and sustainability. 4,000 megawatts of um, renewable energy generation and 4,000 local full-time jobs created. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Thank you so much. I, Anthony, how did you get vehicle to building chargers? What, 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 what what do you do? I mean, like, it, that's so hard. What, what are they? What, what, tell me that story. Um, the, the, sorry, where did I get which one? Your vehicle to building EV chargers. What kind are you? Oh, using? yes. And how did you get yeah, them? So OpConnect actually, it's beautiful. OpConnect purchases any type of charging stations and they retrofit them themselves. So they are not limited by certain. Uh, so they, they have less limitations in supply chain as other people. Brilliant. What is yeah. that business again? <laughs> What's that called? Op, op Connect. OP and then Connect. Okay. And something I didn't m mention is that all of our, um, all of the companies that I mentioned in the beginning, except for Clean Energy Group, a nonprofit, so all the for profit institutions, uh, organizations are black owned as well. Incredible. Wow. Way to go, Anthony. <laughs> You're doing it right. Um, so, okay. So the Jenny Lowe had a question for the ownership. Is it available mm -hmm. to all residents within the anchor institutions or is it constrained to a specific geography of the microgrid? In uh, so the, 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 the community anchor owns the, uh, mic the microgrid. They own the solar and EV charging. Now they have op options to give ownership to other parts of the community, or they could work from a community model in the beginning where the whole community chips in small amounts of money. And so everybody has a, some sort of ownership in there. Uh, we, we talked to them in the beginning, each, each individual group in the beginning about wh which way they want to go with that. Uh, and the reason we're able to do this is uh, working with an organization called Inclusive Prosperity Capital. Uh, and one of the things that's really great about them is they don't ask for collateral of the building. What their collateral is, is the energy savings and revenue generating estimates. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they'll take, they'll take models, they'll take estimates, and they'll use that yes, as a model. Yes, exactly. 
That's yeah. another great movement there. Uh, Jim Lutz wanted to ask you, have you worked yet with um, EBCE, the local community energy agency, East Bay Community Energy? Yeah, um, I've had several conversations with them on other issues. Um, I haven't had a chance to really engage with them on the Clean Energy Hub. Uh, so I, they are on my list of people to talk with, but we really wanted to see how we could do this without relying on the, um, the, the, the grid because we wanted to show that this could work without having a utility who is you know, friendly to these kind of options. But we do want to engage with them. Well, you're demonstrating why you have a doctorate because it is just brilliant. And it's such an integrated and, and pioneering solution that you're proposing here. Uh, but I'll say it again, your vehicle to building strategy is brilliant. I mean, if you counted up the kilowatt hours that you had there for the vehicles, it was about, looked like maybe four times as much as you had on the wall for those Tesla power walls. And I, yeah. I, I didn't see how much they respectively cost, but I'm assuming that the vehicles are less expensive per kilowatt hour. I, I, yeah, it's a, it comes out to be when you factor in all the additional uses you're doing, um, for instance, they were going to buy vehicles anyway, right? right. So they, ha they had to buy three vehicles anyway. So what we did was, hey, pick vehicles that are bi-directional EV charging enabled. So and, and so when you factor in that component, the financial analysis pencils out to do just uh, bi-directional. Brilliant. Um, with that, Anthony, could you move over to the chat if you have any time and energy because you're sick and you're dealing with your kids. But thank you so much for being here. And Jasmine Green's coming up. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.